Greetings, everyone. <sighs> yeah. Hey, now, what do you think about this album, everybody? Lou reads, Sally can't dance no more. She can't get up off the floor. <laughs> I like this album. It was his fourth album. Okay, we got Lee, Lou Reed, the debut. We got Transformer, Berlin, and then this album. Of course, before between Berlin and this album, we had uh, Rock and Roll Animal with a live album, which I thought was a good uh, live album. You know, on my review, I made fun a little bit. I was having a little fun uh, because I thought, that, well, whatever. I, it's a good album. Don't get me wrong. But now we get to Ride Sally Ride or Sally uh, Sally Can't Dance. The album cover there, there's Lou with the blonde hair, you know, with the shades. He's cool, man, with the shades. And reflected in the shades is his partner at the time, Rachel. So this is an interesting album for sure. Superb Sounding is produced by Steve Catch, just like Rock and Roll Animal was, which was a superbly produced album, that album. And this one is too. Sounds great. We've got keyboard player Michael Fonfara. He's from, um, what are he playing? A rhinoceros? A band from the 60s. Electric Flag, a rhinoceros. Um, Lou Reed's always, <laughs> he's always like doo-wop, R&B, soul, you know, funk, rock. He likes everything. And you can tell on this album he does because this album has a lot of different styles in, in its songs. It just changes from one style to the next. It's, so it's very entertaining to listen to in that regard. And I think he wanted to make an album like that uh, with some variety there. And he sure did. We've got R&B, soul, boogie-woogie, funk, uh, rock. We've got New Wave on this album. Years before anybody knew what the heck New Wave was, as far as I know. It's just a fun album. And it's, only, it's only, the only Lou Reed album that reached the top ten. And it made him some, made him some money. He didn't like the album, though. When it was made, he didn't like it. It was produced by Steve Katz and Lou Reed, but I think Lou Reed backed it. I think Steve Katz produced it pretty much. And um, he was doing well with, uh, with you know, uh, Transformer sold well. Um, Rock and Roll Animal sold well. This album sold well. He's doing great. But at this point, he's just thinking, you know, I don't like this stuff that much. And uh, I think that's why he went and made Metal Machine music. And the record company was pushing him. Come on, we need more stuff, man. We're making money here. <laughs> so he put out Metal Machine music. <laughs> I love it. Don't you love it? Anyhow, it's a fun album. Okay, let's get with it. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's still got the grittiness and lyric concision and bite that Lou Reed is known for. So even though it's a fun album with many different styles, still got his lyrics that are, well, for the most part, some of, some of the tracks are not as great as others. But yeah, but it, they're all entertaining. So we're going to start with Ride, Sally, Ride. If this song, I love the opening with that horn. It has a very Berlin feel. It feels like it, uh, it could, like it'd be an, could have been an outtake from Berlin. It has that feel to it, the Berlin, the album. Very soulful with horns and backing vocals and organ, piano. Oh, isn't it nice when your heart is made out of ice? The next track, Animal Language. A lot of people poo-poo this track because it's kind of silly. <clears throat> you know, about ooh, ow, meow, or bow, wow, or whatever. <laughs> I thought it was funny. It doesn't bother me at all. It's an upbeat boogie rocker with horns. It kind of reminds me a little bit of a like an Edgar Winter tune back around that time, early 70s, that kind of boogie-woogie rock. We all had a real good time. It just had that kind of a boogie feel, and I like it. The next track, Baby Face. I love the Here's another totally different track than the previous two. A soulful, slow funk groove. <laughs> it's a rather simple song about a crappy roommate. <laughs> You're not the kind of person that's easy to live with in a house. <laughs> I love his lyrics. The way he writes, he just gets right to the point. No farting around. Right to the point. <laughs> the next song, New York Stars, this one is the one that sounds sort of a new wave sound to it. And I, when I first heard this song, I was like, what the hell? You know, it reminds me a little bit of um, the early 80s Alice Cooper albums. In, in, in tone and in feel and in, in humor. Uh, you know, the, those albums like um, Special Forces, um, Zipper, zipper Catch Your Skin, 
Flush the Fashion, that kind of early new wave-ish, punkish feel. There's some uh, vocal processing here on this song, New York Stars, that give it a little bit of that feel as well. It's a hilarious song about people wanting to look like and act like the stars. You know, the faggot mimic machine. <laughs> that, that's the lyrics. It's not me talking. I didn't say it. No, it's just... <laughs> we need a new people store. Yeah, it's funny. It's a good song. New York Stars. Now, you flip the album over, okay, and you get Kill Your Sons, which is a great song. It's one of the most rocking songs on the album. It's really the fir first one that's just a straight rocker, kind of. Um, I love it. It's very 70s feeling, it's, uh, you know, production style, and in the performance. The, the bass player actually goes to a sort of a disco-ish upbeat during the chorus. Boom, 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 that kind of feel. Very, very much of its time. Apparently, the song was initially an anti-war song, and that's what you'd think when you see the title. Kill your sons. Don't, you don't send your kids off to be killed in some stupid war. But uh, it, later, it was changed to reflect Lou's resentment and anger over being sent to psychiatrists and electroshock therapy when he was young. Uh, see, Lou had certain propensities, certain, uh, you know things that his parents were not too pleased about and they tried to cure him of, if you get my point. So that's what, this, and the song's kind of clever in that it talks about those two-bit psychiatrists and the places that he had to go to. And It's a good song, Kill Your Sons. The next song I love, too, completely different than the other songs. It's called Ennui. It's, spell, it's, print, it's spelled E-N-N-U-I. It's pronounced Ennui which basically means boredom, bored, you know, inactive, lacking adventurous, you know, it's just boredom, boredom. That's a triple meter slow waltz piano ballad with superbly colorful and tasteful electric guitar. I don't know who's playing the guitar here. I forgot to look it up, but he does, he's doing a good job here. Uh, it has a bit of a Leonard Cohen vibe to it, especially later in the song, in the way the song is sung, and just the tone of the song in general. Uh, the lyrics and music just drip with ennui, for sure. Again, boredom, lack of excitement. I love the lyrics. Just, just, just paint a picture of that. And then after that, you get the title track, Sally Can't Dance. Sally Can't Dance No More. What an infectious drive to this song. Uh, funky, with keyboards and horns. It could have easily been a hit, I think, in 1974, about that time. Oh, yeah. I don't think it was. I don't think it was released as a single, was it? Maybe some of you know. I don't know. But it could have been. You can't get it off of the floor. Sally's having a little trouble with, uh, <clears throat> with drugs. And then the song ends with Billy, which is a very simple, repetitive 1-5-4, one, 1-5-4 one, pattern uh, on acoustic guitar. Those of you who know what I'm talking about harmonically, that would be sort of like, a, I don't know what key the song's in, but it would be sort of like a D-A-G, D-A-G, over and over again, that kind of thing. Very simple, swaying acoustic guitar ballad. We got Doug Yule of, um, of Velvet Underground playing bass here. And some guy playing cheesy-ass saxophone. Good night. That's, I don't know what it is about saxophone and songs like this. just like <laughs> nails on a chalkboard to me. But the song is good enough and the lyrics are engaging enough that I can overwrite the cornball sax. It's about two close friends with somewhat different proclivities. You know, different focuses, different interests through school and college, and the uh, uh, results uh, of the, the decisions they make and this and that and things that happen to them. And I, I won't spoil the story, but it's an interesting, very Lou Reed-like story. Yeah, this is not his greatest album. Well, of course not, but it's definitely not his worst. And I really do enjoy it. It's got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight tracks. One right after the next that are completely different than the preceding track. So it's a great uh, sampler of uh, different kind of styles. I think it's fantastic. What do you guys think? You like that album? A lot of people don't. But I don't think it's near as bad as some people say. What do you think about that album? You think it's good? I do. After this, we get Metal Machine Music. I'm going to attempt to review that. It won't take me very long. <laughs> and, then, and then Coney Island, baby, after that one. Great albums. We got some great stuff coming up here. I'm going to go through every one of them. If I if I'm blessed to be waking up every morning, you know, eventually I'll get through all of these. And um, he's one of these artists that just you know, like he entered the '80s. 
He's one of those rare 60s and 70s artists that entered the 80s without crapping the bed, basically. He, he actually did well in the 80s. He tore it up. I, think, I love some of the stuff he did in the 80s. Then the 90s and the 2000s. Okay, just a very unique artist. I can understand why some people wouldn't like him, and I would never try to defend my enthusiasm for him because I can't. I just like it. Okay, <laughs> take care, folks. Bye-bye.